Thanks, y'all, for showing up. Uh, it's going to be a power-packed uh, hour or 50 minutes here. We're used to having a little bit more time, but we're going to make it happen, all right? And uh, I, we're we're uh, been doing this for a little while. Mike Martin and I teamed up like six or eight years ago with this vision inspired by the prophets Mike and Isaiah that God's people will beat their swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. Amen? Um, we don't have a lot of swords in America, but we got a whole lot of guns. And so we got more guns than people in our country. We got about 5% of the world's population and almost half of the world's guns. So we decided people probably got some they want to donate. We started taking donated guns from all over the country and turning them into garden tools. And I, I, I brought two with me that are important to us. Actually, first of all, this is what we start with. The first gun that we both had donated was an AK-47. That's part of our problem, right? And uh, uh, fo folks donated this AK-47. So we have uh, a chopped up AK-47 that we carry as a symbol of what's before, and we know what's coming after, all right? So doesn't it look better like that? Yeah. So we'll lay that up here. And then I wanted to show you uh, the very first tool that we made. Together was this one. Um, it was a handgun that we found in an abandoned house in Philadelphia. One of those signs of how saturated we are with guns. We found this in an abandoned house that we were going to fix up. And we beat on it and beat it into this plow. And one of the reasons this was so powerful was because we invited the moms and dads who had lost their kids to take the hammer. And this one mother in Philadelphia began to beat on that thing. And with every thump of the hammer, she said, this is for my boy. And I think it was the first time that it really hit us that what we're doing today is not just symbolic. It is giving space to the grief and the pain and the trauma that gun violence has taken on so many people in our country. Uh, in fact, almost half of us, statistics show, know someone directly who has been shot. And so we're going to think about that. We also want to honor the fact that these stories are at the center of everything that we do. And so it is a great honor for me to stand beside a woman who's been a hero of mine for a long time, um, uh, Reverend Sharon Risher. Give her a hand. She's right back there. She's going to come up in just a little bit. But she is a powerhouse in the movement, and you're going to hear more of her uh, in a little bit. She's also going to be on the main stage because uh, the Wild Goose Festival folks said we can't just have her at one time. We're going to get as much love out of her as we can. So they're going to, you're going to hear more from her. The second plow that we carry with us is uh, one that was one of the last tools we made together. This uh, was made out of an AR-15. And we beat this one into this plow. Mike sometimes says you can tell he gets a little bit better as he goes along. But this was a more recent. And this one's special because we, we did it as a public demonstration in Philly. And we marched to our senator's office. And we asked for a ban on assault rifles. And the, Senator Toomey in Philly is one of those senators that came out after Sandy Hook saying, Never again. And yet he began to go into the thoughts and prayers camp, you know what I mean. And we've seen it happen again and again. And so we took this to him, and we had a pray-in, and we said, we're not leaving until you take your plow, and you also uh, ban assault weapons in the city of Philly and in, in our country. We want to ban assault weapons. So he never came, and we still have his plow. Like 50 of us got arrested, and we'd do it again. But as we were being led off by the police officers, they said, we're with you. It's crazy that we have these still on our streets, right? So we leave that here. We're going we're gonna to plan a second delivery. Uh, but I want you to meet Mike because he's going to spend most of his time back at the plow. But he's the one that does so much of the hard work. He's first a pastor but became a blacksmith because he saw that this is pastoral work, honoring the trauma and seeing a way to turn something made to kill into something that's made for life.
Like Shane said, we've been working together for about six years now. And it all for raw tools, raw is war backwards. And it's all out of the scripture of swords to plowshares. That if you get rid of your swords and you choose to take up plowshares instead, you have to depend on things in your life and your community differently than you did when you carried that sword. So what do we replace the tools of violence with tools of life to, to help hold up our neighborhoods that way? And for us, Sandy Hook was the shooting that really stirred us into action. But it shouldn't have taken that long. And I think a lot of us feel that way. And maybe some of us still aren't there yet that I was in high school when Columbine happened and that didn't really stir much for me, even though I live and went to school a half hour south of Columbine. And then mass shooting after mass shooting kept happening. It wasn't until my wife was a first grade teacher and the same number of kids that died in Sandy Hook were the same number of kids that were in her classroom. And suddenly I thought about my wife having to jump in front of a shooter or whatever that looks like for people. And then when we did this book tour, we had somebody who actually lived through Columbine and was talking about a story where she is now a teacher and they were doing an active shooting drill and one of the kids shushed another one and he said, we're practicing how to die. And that's so these active shooter drills are now creating trauma for kids uh, in our schools. And so when we do these things, uh, we think about the Columbines and the Sandy Hooks, but today we really want to focus on Charleston and uh, Reverend Risher's story. And we were here four years ago. I don't know if anybody was here then. And that was three weeks after the Charleston shooting at the AME Church there. And uh, Reverend Jennifer Bailey, who's a part of the AME Church, really helped hold space for that in an in event very much like what we're doing here today. And there's a connection there. The AME Church started in the basement of a blacksmith shop. Uh, what, so there's, there's something about going to the anvil that really resembles going to Jesus when things are broken, that we go to a place that transformation can happen, and we do it as a community. So uh, just keep that in your, in your spaces as we're, as we're hearing the stories today. And, uh, and really that there's, there's so many people who are dealing with uh, the trauma of gun violence and they're carrying way too much weight. And so for those of us who don't have that as a direct trauma in our story, that we can start carrying some of that weight too. So thanks you all for, for coming to the session. You have a, a ton of options uh, and, we're, and we're looking forward to doing some transformation with you all. So he's, we're going to send him out. Hold on just a second. We're going to send him to the forge, but tell us about the guns because they, what, what's also so powerful is almost everywhere we go, there are po people that are disarming, right, that are giving guns to be transformed. So we have uh, something that came from Wild Goose. So we have a disarming network across the country, and through that we help facilitate individuals who want to donate guns to us. We usually hook them up with a, a church parking lot in their area, and they go there and disable them, and then we make them into tools. And so today, uh, uh, Robert, are you out there? Where are you at? That's Robert back there. He, he donated uh, three guns through, uh, to Raw Tools for this, and uh, we'll be working on two of them back here. So one of the, the your fellow Wild Goose attendees is, is part of this transformation here. Um, someone, he, yeah. <laughs> I asked him why he didn't. He says, essentially, I'm tired of it. Uh, the, the subtitle to our book is for people who hope for people who are weary of violence and that we want to see some, this narrative change. And Robert is very much living into that narrative. So thank you, Robert, for making that uh, contribution today. Okay. We got to get him out to the forge. Give him a hand. Uh, he's going to be back there because... Like we said, we've never done it in this uh, tight amount of space. So he's going to be thumping back there on the metal. And it's actually beautiful background sounds to this conversation. Because literally, in a matter of one hour, we're going from a gun to a garden tool. And when we uh, in our country feel like sometimes we don't just need more thoughts and prayers and debates, we need some concrete change, that's what we're seeing happen back there in the corner, all right? So as we get going... I want to just center us, because today's going to start a little heavy, but we're going to move towards the hope, right? We, we are honoring the fact that things are not okay in America. And so to, to kind of ground us in that, that we're going from a gun to a plow, from swords to plows, um, we, we, we want to uh, just remember that this, this violence goes all the way back to Cain and Abel right? The, uh, one of the inaugural sins we see outside the Garden of Eden is a brother killing a brother. 
And then it says in that story that the blood cried out to God from the ground. So God, God feels the, the blood and the pain and the agony of, of the, 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 the violence of our sins, right? Going all the way back to the, what we did to native peoples, perhaps even on this land where we are. The, what we, uh, the role that guns played in enslaving and subjugating uh, uh, African Americans. And so all of this is kind of tied together, right? And there's folks who say it's not a gun problem, it's a heart problem. And what we want to invite you to think about today is it's both right our gun violence is a gun problem and a heart problem and God heals hearts and people change laws right so we need to think about both of those and in fact we could get rid of every gun in America and people would still find ways to kill each other Right? We, we've seen someone turn a pressure cooker into a bomb in the Boston Marathon. So we are conniving folks in our heart. We can find ways to hurt people, drive a car into a crowd, whatever. And yet there is something unique about guns that are designed to kill. Guns like the AR-15 that are made to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And that's what they keep getting used for. So as we think about it, let me just center us in a few realities reality checks of where we are. And after each of these, I invite you, if you feel so moved, just to say, Lord, have mercy. All right? In the U.S., we manufacture nine and a half million guns a year. 25,000 guns a day, 18 guns a minute, one gun every three seconds. America has about 105 lives lost every day to guns, 38,000 a year. And in the last 50 years, that number has not dropped below 32,000, which means in 40 years, we've lost over 1.2 million lives to guns. Lord, Lord have mercy. As we think of that in the perspective, we've, we've lost more guns domestically in two decades than in 250 years of foreign wars. Lord, have mercy. We have five times more gun dealers in America than McDonald's restaurants. Lord, have mercy. And that's not an argument for more McDonald's, just for the record, right? <laughs> But as we think of uh, uh, this, it's the, the number two cause of death of our children. Gun violence, number two. It's number one for African-American children. Lord, have mercy. It's the number one cause of death of police officers killed in the line of duty. And we still have bullets that are designed to pierce through bulletproof jackets that are legal in our country. Lord have mercy. The largest cause of military deaths is not combat, but suicide by their own guns. More military service members are killed with their own weapons than are killed in combat. Lord have mercy. In fact, we've had a lot of military folks come take the hammer and beat on the guns. And we think of suicide in general. And suicide makes up two-thirds of all of our gun deaths. As we think of those lives lost to suicide, guns play such a key role because almost everybody who attempts suicide with a gun ends up dying. But what's true of every other means is only almost 90% of people who attempt suicide without a gun survive, and most of them do not die from suicide. They're able to get help. So access to guns is a part of our epidemic of suicide deaths and we can do better right so that's why we say this is a pro-life issue isn't it crazy in america that we have so narrowed what it means to be pro-life to one issue of abortion that you can still be pro-guns pro-military pro-death penalty and not care about life in every form so this is a pro-life issue and we are standing on the side of life we are with the audacity to say we may not say every life but we can do better than 105 a day in this country we can do better and it grieves God's heart right so let me bring up my sister 
Because she's, you know, it's one thing to talk about this in just statistics, but what has to move us is our, our hearts, you know, to see that there is a human toll. That's what happened for me. In my neighborhood in North Philadelphia, we had a young man, 19 years old, that died on our front steps. And I held his hand as he took his last few breaths. And there came a moment after Papito died that I said, enough. Right, that Dr. Martin Luther King said, we're called to be the good Samaritan and lift our neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, maybe we need to rethink the whole road to Jericho. Amen. And so here is a woman who is out of her own story. She's written an incredible book for such a time as this. But she also speaks out of her own pain and out of her own hope that the world can be made different. So welcome our sister, Reverend Sharon Risher. While it's definitely my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. I'm going to be honest, I never knew what the Wild Goose Festival was all about <laughs> until Shane contacted me. I think I'd seen it, but just never really delved into what this festival was about. So it's truly my honor to be here. Uh, a good friend, Dr. Michael Waters, spoke here before, and he told me about when, when I found out that I was going to be here. I got on the phone. I called Mike. Mike, I'm going to be at the Wild Goose Festival. And he told me about the great experience he had. And so, like I said, I'm just honored to be here. I stand before you today as a proud daughter of the American South, a true Geechee girl from the low country of Charleston, South Carolina. My Southern black heritage has shaped me into the woman of faith that I am today. But like many African Americans from the South, I'm no stranger to the hate and intolerance that has unfortunately defined a large part of my African-American experience. On June 17, 2015, a young white 21-year-old white supremacist walked into Emmanuel AME Church and decided that that would be the night that he would go into that church and kill as many people as he could. This was not a crime of passion. This was a premeditated murders. He had scoped out the church, had made trips to Charleston. He knew where the entrance and the exit of that church was. After about an hour of studying the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, the, par the parable of the sower, they gathered in a circle to be dismissed in prayer. While holding hands and heads bowed and eyes closed, their lives came to a fateful end. Five people survive and five people have to live with the tragedy in their hearts and minds every day. I continue to say their names because my mission in life is to help other people know that hate won't win. Say it with me. Hate won't win. I continue to call their names because they gave their lives for a higher purpose and always should be remembered. They are my mother, Mrs. Ethel Lance, my two cousins, Mrs. Susie Jackson and Tywanza Sanders, my childhood friend, Myra Thompson, the pastor of the church, Reverend Clemente Pinckney, Reverend Daniel Simmons, Reverend Sharonda Coleman Singleton, Mrs. Cynthia Hurd, and Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor. 
whenever you hear those names or see those names in print, know that they were killed, but God welcomed them. Losing my mother and my cousins in the most horrific manner shook me to my very core. I had to keep myself from succumbing to nothingness or fight for my very soul. I was confronted with so many things going on at the same time. Gun violence, racism, forgiveness, and the death penalty. I don't know if I buried my head in the sand, but before the death of the nine in Charleston, I didn't believe that there were millions of people that believed and followed a white supremacist, white nationalist ideology. Hate coupled with a gun is a very dangerous combination. Many people believe the gun violence we experience in this country is not a political issue. Well, it is a political issue, a political issue because our lawmakers are bounded by the gun lobby and because millions of dollars are involved with guns. But you see, it's more than that. Just like Shane said, it's a heart condition because if gun violence in America does not make your heart hurt, cause pain in your soul, I don't know what will. We need more people to realize. Shane has given all the statistics that die by gun violence through homicides in my city of Charlotte, North Carolina. To date, there has been 62 homicides by gun in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have suicides and unintentional shootings. Shane has given you the statistics, so I won't go back to that. But you see, because of blatant acts of hate, that saturated its blood in Emmanuel AME Church, and all the other churches and mosques and synagogues and the thousand others who have died and survived gun violence. I stand here today as one of many, many accidental activists, but yet, for us believers in Jesus, we know that in a scriptural understanding, there are no accidents. God's plan for our lives were predestined in the womb. So I guess I could say I'm an appointed activist. Appointed because God has set us out, sent me out for this appointed time, in God's time, for such a time as this. You see, not every activist starts out with the goal of changing the world. Many of us use our stories and our voices to hopefully invoke change, mostly in the communities where we lived. I happened to get hooked up with one of the largest grassroots advocacy group on gun violence prevention, Moms Demand Action, and Every Town Survivor Network. Through my activism with these groups, God has allowed me to be on national platforms. Never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would meet the people that I have met, people that cause change, people who are out here fighting the good fight. As people of faith, messengers of God's love and grace, I believe we have a duty to continue the conversation about racism and gun violence again and again. We can't sit by 
and wait for other people to help us. We must stand up for ourselves, people. We must preach a gospel of social justice and be willing to suffer the consequences for your sacrifice. As the church universal, we could truly live out what Dr. Martin Luther King called the beloved community. Dr. King said we must stay awake and commit ourselves to enter on the side of God's love and justice. Dr. King also said a church that has lost its voice for justice is a church that has lost its relevance in the world. Can I get an amen? amen? Churches, we can no longer sit on the sidelines while our sisters and brothers are in need. We must stand together, church and community, to address the crisis of gun violence in our communities. I have said time and time again, prayers and vigils are not enough. We have to take action in a real way. We need prayers with feet and hands, prayers with actions, boots on the ground. We need people to be willing to call our lawmakers, educate themselves on the gun laws that are being passed. For too long, change has been disillusioned by the Washington gun lobby and by the leaders who refuse to take common sense steps that will save lives through gun law reform and legislation. I'm sick of hearing our legislators talk about sending thoughts and prayers. There comes a time in our lives where we all will face some of the most challenging experiences in our lives. How we decide to accept and press forward defines who you are, who we are. I didn't ask for this journey I'm on, y'all. But this is where God has placed me. The words of Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 9 says, His words is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. My quest for helping to end gun violence is like fire in my bones. I can't shut up. I won't shut up. This is an overwhelming, there's a lot of work to be done. We can't stay complacent and not be part of the path to wholeness and healing. I hope you have heard one thing today that will motivate you to do just a little bit more, helping to save lives. I pray that you will join me in this effort because you see, this is our life. These are our voices. We have power. We have options. We can be the change we want to see. God bless you. So we asked Reverend Sharon if she wanted to uh, take the hammer today. 
<laughs> What'd you say? Hell yeah. <laughs> Bless you, sister. So she's going to head back. What I want to ask us to do is to hold the silence, okay? A sacred silence as Reverend Sharon goes to take the hammer. We remember our brothers and sisters at Mother Emanuel AME and those all over the country who are suffering from the wounds of gun violence. So let's hold the silence as our sister takes the hammer. I hit this, Mama. I hit this for you. I hit this for Tawanza. I hit this for Cousin Susie and all the others that died in that church. I hit for gun violence, gun violence. I hit this. What we've seen across this country is the power of seeing people out of their pain voice their hope to transform the world and refusing to allow thoughts and prayers to be the only answer. We are people of prayer, amen? But one of my mentors said, good things come to those who wait upon the Lord sometimes, and other times good things come to those who get off their butts and make stuff happen, right? So we are people of prayer, but we're also people of action, and thank you. Thank you, Reverend Sharon, for your courage, for your hope, for the fire in your bones at such a time as this. In the last few minutes, Mike needs a few. You doing okay back there, buddy? Give it up for Mike back there in the back, in the heat. You don't have a microphone, do you, bro? I'm gonna, I, we've done this about 50 times together, so I'm going to just put, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share one thing that he always shares at the Forge, which is um, one of the things that we do, because this is a hard issue, is a lot of times when we have a little bit more time, we invite people to identify their own pain, their own fears, their own resentments, their own aggressions, and we've written those down and thrown them into the forge. But one of the things that Mike reminds us, as he said in the beginning, is that the fire of the forge reminds us of the Spirit of God. And when you take the cold, hard metal and you put it in the forge, it begins to soften. And it begins to be made malleable. In fact, if you just hit the metal without heating it up in the forge, it can shatter and crack, right? But it's a reminder that we're to, we're to stay near to God. And Mike sometimes says, maybe what happened to Pharaoh was he got too far, far from the fire, right? And his heart hardened. And the fire, as you see the metal in the fire, it begins to take on the character of the fire. It begins to glow like the fire glows. Come on, somebody. There's a sermon in here, right? That when we stay near to Jesus, we begin to burn like Jesus burns. We begin to have that fire in our bones that we cannot stay silent. We have to do something about the pain of our community. So it's a reminder to all of us to stay near to the fire right now and allow our hearts to be softened, to be uh, tender to the, 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 the pain of our communities. And it's also a reminder, and I, I want to just, it would be irresponsible not to mention that what we discovered as we were studying gun violence is that it's not just a political problem. It is a moral and spiritual problem in the church, right? That we actually found that statistically Christians own guns at a higher rate than the general population. We got a spiritual crisis in our Christianity and gun violence is one manifestation of it, right? I'm going to just show you how wild it is. One of my pastor friends said, um, what, this is one of the best-selling Bible cases in the entire country. And he said, now hold on, open it up. And uh, he said, it is actually a gun case. 
camouflage as a Bible case. Literally, you can't make this stuff up, right? But it shows you how deep this goes into our spirituality. When we have pastors saying, bring your guns to church, we've got a problem, right? We have a different take on that, which is we, we want to have some BYOG Sundays. Bring your own gun and lay them at the altar. We're going to chop them up and melt them down, right? But that's... But, but the cross and the gun give us two very different versions of power, right? One of them says, I am willing to die for something. The other says, I'm willing to kill. And the question at the end of the day becomes, which looks most like Jesus, right? And the early Christians, they began to understand that you can't hold the cross in one hand and a weapon in the other. That Jesus' is called to love our enemies means we cannot simultaneously prepare to kill them. That Jesus shows us a way to live in a violent world without mirroring the very violence we're trying to heal the world of, right? And it doesn't get any better than, uh, you know, old Peter. I like, I like old Peter. Uh, you know, Jesus is right hand man because he's he's always making mistakes and speaking out of turn sometimes, you know, and uh, but I like him because we can see ourselves in him a little bit, you know, and 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 the really bad day from Peter for Peter was when the soldiers came to get Jesus. Right. I mean, Peter has ser heard the Sermon on the Mount live in real time from the man himself. And yet. But then there's those days when the soldiers come, right? And so he still impulsively picks up a sword and cuts off one of the guy's ears. But Jesus' response is stunning, right? He tells Peter, no, put that away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Enough of that. That's not how we roll. Paraphrasing a little bit, you know. But he, And then he... <laughs> He heals the guy that Jesus, that Peter wounded. Jesus picks the guy's ear up and puts it back on, which is cool, right? Pop, let me help you out, brother, you know? I think of dinner that night with that guy, you know, and his kids. Like, how's your day? Kids are like, uh, all right, I got a lot of Aramaic homework. How's your day, Dad? Dad's like, weird. Like, we came to arrest this guy. One of his bros picked up a sword and cut my ear off. And then the guy that we came to arrest... Put my ear back on. Check it out. You know, I mean, he'll tell that story a few times, I think, you know. <laughs> he was scarred by grace. And the early Christians got the message. They said, when Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed every one of us. Because if, if ever there was a case for standing your ground, come on somebody, like Peter had the textbook case, right? For using violence to protect the innocent, but Jesus shows him another way. That love is willing to die, but love doesn't kill. Love doesn't hurt. Love is not violent. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down their life for another. But we dare not take a life. So this is a spiritual crisis, amen? And it has everything to do with love and fear. I mean, we have a culture right now which is so driven by fear, right? And yet our fears are so irrational. The Cato Institute, we cite it in our book, uh, in the Cato Institute, um, they showed how irrational our fears are, right? So they list all the things that are more likely to kill you than an immigrant or a refugee. And they are things like swing sets. Cows. A cow, brother, is more likely to kill you than a refugee. Uh, um, <laughs> falling down steps. More likely to kill you than an immigrant or a refugee. Now here's the kicker. Uh, uh, a vending machine falling on you is more likely to kill you than an immigrant or a refugee. But ain't nobody walking around a Coke machine like, look out. You know, like, <laughs> we are conditioned to fear. We are conditioned to fear. And we are conditioned to fear people who aren't like us, right? We are conditioned to fear in a certain way that meets the narrative. And yet, over and over, we see that actually you are two times more likely to die from a white man than a Muslim in America. 71% of extreme hate crimes are not Muslims and people of color. They are white men like the man who went into the Emmanuel AME church. And yet, that's not how we're being conditioned, right? So we want to say to today that we will claim the biblical promise that love casteth out fear. And we see what happens to a country where fear 
is driving so many of our policies and our conversations rather than love. And our question is, what would the country look like if love were driving us? Love instead of fear. Amen? What if we were forming policies that were standing on the side of life and more and the most vulnerable rather than on the side of fear? Amen? I'm seeing my brother Mike over here. That's my cue. I just get to preach and kill time until he comes up. So here he is. You're ready, huh? Let's give it up for Mike. We've got a plow. So plowshares condition us for something different. Yeah. We move from the illusion of instant gratification of some sort of illusion of justice in the gun towards this seasonal patience that requires us to take care of the seeds that we plant, not just literally in the furrows that these can create, but also in our neighborhood. There's a, um, a neat thing that we found out, the stats that he uh, put off earlier, those nine plus million of guns comes down to three guns every second that we make in this country. And we can take, on average, and make three tools out of every gun that is donated. So we can flip that script. There's a lot going on here. Isaiah and Micah were way ahead of their time yeah. when they thought about turning swords into plowshares. And I think that that practice of planting and tending to a garden, does anyone here take part in therapy gardens? There is a lot of powerful movements happening in therapy gardening. That is, if you heard Science Mike before us, he spoke to that a little bit, even though he was watering the garden that his family planted, that that is part of his healing process. So uh, there's a lot of powerful ways that we get to see this turned, uh, really flipping the script from a handgun that can be concealed and used in the, in, in the most awful ways. We talk about assault rifles and, and how horrible they are. Handguns are, are assault rifles in your pocket and they're easily to con easy to conceal and you can put clips of 30 in those too. So there's a lot to be said about how we handle uh, caring for our individual instead of caring for our community and going from a sword to plow makes that transition. And when we gather around the anvil or when we go to Jesus, we open ourselves up to be softened and to be transformed for the betterment of our community and not just ourselves. Amen. So, uh, So we're, in a second, we're going to dedicate the plow that Mike made today, but we want to, you know, circle back with, with that sign of hope from Mike and Isaiah. And this is a time to be hopeful because even though the NRA, they say that they have 5 million people, and let's take them at that, that what they're also saying is that over 90% of gun owners are not a part of the NRA. In fact, a wild majority of gun owners in this country want to see change happen, and even more when you look at Americans as a whole. So we've even had gun owners come out and march with us with shirts on that say, I'm a gun owner against gun violence. I'm a hunter against assault weapons because you don't need 10 rounds to shoot a deer, right? Like, so we're seeing movement happen, but it's that, that it's going to be up to us, right? And what's so powerful in that vision of Mike and Isaiah is that peace doesn't begin with politicians. It's not the kings and presidents that lead the nations to peace. It's the people of God who are the conscience and who begin to uh, create the, the, the compassion that rises up and say, we will not kill. In fact, we will beat these filthy, rotten weapons into garden tools. We will turn death into life. And so Walter Brueggemann, who's been a great friend of ours and friend of this movement, he said, he wrote the book, uh, Prophetic Imagination, right? And he says, sometimes we misunderstand the prophets and we think the prophets were fortune tellers, but they were actually truth tellers. They weren't just trying to predict the future. They were trying to name the present and change the present so that we can build a different future from where we are headed right now. So we heard of a prophetess this morning, right? Give it up one more time for Reverend Sharon. I'm going to ask Paul and Tricia to come back up. They're going to send us out. But the finale that we always want to end with is by dedicating the plow, because this is the concrete change that you made here at Wild Goose Festival. So Mike's going to do the dedication. We want to dedicate this to Reverend Sharon. There's something we learned on our book tour from one of the blacksmiths in our uh, disarming network. She said that often uh, workers of metal see that iron is the blood of the earth. And there's something beautiful that happened back there, that the blood of the earth met the cries of those we've lost to gun violence. 
and you helped make this tool and your hammer marks are on this tool. So bless, blessings to you as you use this, uh, literally or figuratively, it really doesn't matter however you feel the power that it can take into a room to help you do your work. And thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I don't even have words, and I'm a preacher, so you know that's. Uh, uh, but uh, Shane, and I, I just thank you. This will mean so much. You don't know what it meant to me to be able to beat on this thing. It was like I finally had a physical manifestation of being able to get that anger and rage that I had to work so diligently to get out of my spirit and my soul. And today, God gave me a physical way to say that you can get rid of it and you don't have to visit no more because I've got you and I'm going to send you and all I can say is send me, send me. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside, we're gonna lay down our sword and shield. Down by the riverside, we ain't gonna study war no more. 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 We're gonna walk with the Prince of Peace down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. We're gonna walk with the Prince of Peace down by the riverside. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna study war no more. 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 Amen. Oh,